Yeah. Now, yeah. I um, realized that on Monday yeah. morning. I was like, maybe and Molly I wasn't too. checking my voice. My brother got married, so it was three very. And I remember having contacts. Days, days of like. somebody come in when I leave. We're working on that. Nobody would commit to the time exactly. So that's, you know, you can get up and leave and then we'll fill somebody in. Looks like we may have votes.
Good afternoon. The Subcommittee on Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia will now come to order. Uh, I want to welcome Ranking Member Chaffetz, members of the Subcommittee hearing, witnesses, and all those in attendance. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine H.R. 4489, the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program Prescription Drug Integrity Transparency and Cost Savings Act. The Chair, Ranking Members, and Subcommittee Members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all statements uh, will be open for three days to submit uh, amendments for the record. Before proceeding, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that Representative Steve Driehaus be allowed to join us to ask questions and to offer testimony uh, and appear before the Subcommittee here today. Hearing no objections, that is so ordered. I'd also like to ask unanimous consent that the testimonies of Mr. David Balto, Navitus, the Coalition of Government Procurement, and the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association be submitted for the record. Again, hearing no objection, so ordered. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, the subcommittee convenes to examine H.R. 4489, the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program Prescription Drug Integrity Transparency and Cost Savings Act. Simply put, the reason I introduced this legislation was to lower the cost of prescription drugs in the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, the FEHBP. I'll try to avoid that, that, uh, that acronym uh, as much as possible. Uh, in these economically challenging times, it's unacceptable to ask Federal employees and the American taxpayer to put up with some of the irregularities that exist in the pricing and contractual arrangement of the Federal employees health benefit plan, which accounts for nearly 30 percent of the Federal Government's total spend on the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. If the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program wants to remain a model for providing health benefits, then legislative changes that allow for alternative prescription drug benefit contracting and pricing are needed. H.R. 4489 is the byproduct of nearly a year's worth of work and research. As many as you will recall, the subcommittee conducted an oversight hearing on this very issue back in June. Moreover, last fall we held a public policy forum with key stakeholders and public agencies to further analyze various approaches to fixing what I would describe as an opaque and flawed health benefit plan design. And what we have discovered is that our Federal employees and retirees are not receiving nearly the best benefit at the best price as it relates to prescription drugs. In fact, when comparing Federal Employee Health Benefit Program drug prices to that of other Federal programs, such as the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Defense, Medicare, Medicaid, and the Public Health Service 30, 340B program, the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program is paying substantially more for its drugs. That's despite having 8 million uh, paying members. Even more alarming is that a recent study on the cost of generic drugs performed by one of our witnesses here today, Change to Win, shows that having no drug coverage beats having coverage under the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program. How can people state that Federal employees have the best health insurance in the country when people with no insurance are paying less for their, description, their prescription drugs? I'm also baffled by the fact that even within the program we see larger plans charging far more for prescription drugs in comparison to smaller plans, despite having a sizable difference in the number of enrollees. Does the market-based concept of leverage not apply to Federal employee health benefit programs? The legislation that my colleagues, Mr. Connolly and Mr. Cummings, and I introduced is intended to not only lower costs of prescription drugs in the Federal employee health benefit program, but to also provide our Federal employees with a safer, high-quality prescription drug benefit by affording the Office of Personnel Management greater oversight authority in the contracting and pricing of the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program, prescription drug benefits specifically. Prohibiting certain ownership relationships requiring a excuse me, pharmacy benefit managers to return 99 percent of all the monies received from manufacturers for Federal Employee Health Benefit Programs business, capping prices paid for, excuse me, paid by the health plan to the average manufactured price, AMP, restricting drug switching by pharmacy benefit managers, and requiring enhanced transparency and disclosure of all contract terms and related information. 
In this day and age when every effort is being made to reduce federal spending and to find money to fund health care reform and other domestic policy priorities, the level of ambiguity around costs and drug prices under the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program is appalling, and this must change. As chairman of this subcommittee, I am committed to providing the best benefits to our Federal employees at the best price, and whether that is accomplished by the provisions contained in H.R. 4489 or by agency regulation and contractual changes, like those issued by the Office of Personnel Management yesterday in the carrier call letter, makes no difference to me. Let the end justify the means as long as we aren't simply maintaining the status quo. I would like to thank today's witnesses for sharing their thoughts, insights and expertise on this complex issue. I understand that several of you have come quite a way to be here with, be here with us today, and I deeply appreciate your willingness in helping the subcommittee determine how best to improve the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program prescription drug benefit for both the Federal employee and the American taxpayer. Again, I thank you for your participation, and I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses. I would like to yield now to the Ranking Member, uh, Mr. Chaffetz from Utah, for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I simply want to thank you for holding this hearing. I want to thank our witnesses uh, for coming and uh, their expertise and sharing candidly their thoughts and perspectives. I, too, want to save money for federal workers and, and importantly, uh, most importantly, the taxpayers' money. Uh, and hopefully we can achieve that. Uh, again, I thank you for being here. I yield back the balance of my time. <clears throat> it, is the, uh, it is the custom of this uh, subcommittee to swear witnesses. Uh, we are graced with the uh, presence of uh, Congressman Anthony Weiner. Uh, Mr. Weiner has represented uh, New York's 9th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives since 1999. He is currently a member of the Committee on the Judiciary and the Committee on Energy and Commerce, where he serves as the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on Communications, Technology and the Internet. Before entering Congress, Representative Weiner served in the New York City Council. And uh, I'm going to ask my friend to please rise and raise your right hand. Now, do you swear, excuse me, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record show that the witness is answered in the affirmative. My friend, uh, Mr. Weiner, you now have five minutes for an opening statement. Well, th uh, thank you very much. Um, and I have prepared testimony, but with your indulgence, I would just uh, like to submit that for the record and just make a few remarks. Without objection. You know, it's important that we understand that PBMs do an important thing. They are a valuable tool. The, the way they work is that a big, so a big employer who has an insurance company might not want to be in the benefits management business and pharmaceuticals, might not know the ins and outs, so they hire a PBM to take that market pool that they have that gives them some clout in the marketplace and have someone manage that clout. The only question here is who should benefit from that? Should it be the person that hires the PBM, whether it be a labor union, whether it be an employer, or whether it be, in this case, the federal government, or should it be the PBM itself? That's the only question. And the problem that we have is for us to figure out who should derive those benefits, we need to know what benefits there are. And we don't have that knowledge right now. For example, if the, if the employees of the federal government hire a PBM to go negotiate the best price for Lipitor, we don't know what that best price they're getting is. All we know is what the PBMs say, here's the deal we got. It could very well be that there's an extra 2 or $3 a dose that the PBM benefited from. And we may make the decision as taxpayers, you know what, that's okay. We're willing to pay that price. The PBM is doing a valuable thing. They should get a piece of the action. Transparency is very important, and that's what your legislation seeks to do. And I should point out that if there's a point of con consensus in the health care debate, although sometimes my Republican friends don't acknowledge it, is we all agree with the idea of using market-based solutions. For those of us who support a single-payer plan, we believe we get the biggest possible market to be able to negotiate for lowest prices. All the health care plans that are out there take the idea of having a big market to use that market strength to negotiate for lower prices, to use that to do what Walmart does, take their big market pool and negotiate for the lowest prices. PBMs do help us do that. I don't think that anyone should say that PBMs are not created for that purpose. The question is, are we getting the fullest benefit of it? Now, in the House version of the health care bill, we have PBM transparency for everyone, not just for federal employees. 
Uh, I believe in the Senate bill it's also in there. With the philosophy being the same thing, we may agree or disagree with what the PBMs are doing, but we should have transparency. And I think if your bill becomes law, here's what we'll find that will happen is the PBMs will still have every incentive in the world to negotiate for the best prices for taxpayers, but we will have some insight. Did they get an extra rebate here that maybe we want more of? And your legislation, which says that 90 percent of what you save should go back to the taxpayer, seems like a reasonable transaction fee. 10 percent, they're still going to do very well for themselves. So I think that your legislation is, is very important. I think that all of us should be able to agree what's the point of having this big buying pool if we're not getting the, be the benefit of it. That's what PBMs are in the business of doing. We just want to make sure they're in the business of doing it for the taxpayer. And that's the philosophy behind your bill, and that's why I heartily support it. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. I realize that you have uh, commi other committee oh, I uh, am, obligations I am as well. Pa I have, I'm a very busy man, Mr. Lynch. Okay, this, all right. As you know, this health care debate will we, simply not proceed forward without my presence. Exactly, so. exactly. Yeah, that's what I understand. So we are going to excuse you, and, uh, and uh, we're going to accept your, your testimony in full. And we thank you for your attendance at this hearing thank and for, for assisting indulgence. the committee with its work. Thank you. I'd like to call our second panel, if we could. <laughs> please, please be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Before we proceed with the second panel, I would like to uh, offer time to my colleagues for a brief opening statement. The chair now recognizes the general lady from the District of Columbia, Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, there are a quarter of uh, there are uh, um, a quarter of a million federal employees who are not covered by FEHBP at all, much less by its prescription drug program. That is a scandal. Uh, I am now talking about people who can't afford to be in a program where the government presumably pays 70 percent of the cost, although there is great cost shifting uh, in uh, FEHBP. Um, and of these programs to have a benefit program, a prescription benefit program, where there is no regulation, no negotiation, and no transparency required by the FEHBP uh, is um, beyond belief, especially when you consider that prices for uh, drugs for federal workers have been, ri have been rising. I did some work on, on even the FEHBP, which is now modeled for of what we want to do in the health in the health health bill health reform bill, uh, and uh, the, uh, the even even the compact we have has not uh, kept prices down with FEHBP in the picture. 
So I, so I have no confidence in the prescription drug program, and I think your bill, Mr. Mr. Chairman, goes uh, some distance, particularly in the transparency requirement. <laughs> you would think that that's 101 in any federal bill. Uh, in, in, moving, in moving us ahead. Ms. Mr. Chairman, I cannot believe, let us analogize ourselves to uh, the biggest uh, Fortune 500, what is it, Walmart? Uh, can you believe that Walmart as the customer would be buying drugs from, uh, from the same set of sources at different prices? Wouldn't it be using its buying power to make sure that if it were, to, to chase this analogy further, the DOD or the VA, that those who work for the federal government were getting the very same deal? That also escapes my understanding. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what you are doing about what you took testimony uh, on at the last hearing concerning the uh, uh, conflict of interest with some pharmacy owners could not be more important in your bill. This has become a matter of national uh, uh, disgrace because it is now all over the media about how these retail pharmacy owned uh, companies are bilking uh, the public. So the time has come, Mr. Chairman, to move on your bill and I can't thank you enough for early in the year bringing us to this point today where we're doing a direct hearing on your bill. I thank the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Baltimore, excuse me, Maryland, uh, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman Lynch, I, I really do appreciate you holding this hearing uh, on the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, Prescription Drug Integrity, Transparency, and Cost Savings Act. In June of last year, this subcommittee held a uh, hearing to examine, examine the contracting and pricing model used in the FEHBP, as well as trying to determine whether the program's drug benefit program was a good value. We concluded that for both taxpayers and FEHBP subscribers, changes in the program's contracting and pricing of prescription drugs was necessary in order to ensure that the benefit was being administered in the most fiscally responsible manner. The FEHBP is the largest employer-sponsored health insurance program in the country, covering over 8 million workers, members of Congress, and their families. Almost 30 percent of HEHBP premium payments are for prescription drugs. One of the major discussions during the June hearing was around the FEHBP being charged more for its drugs than other federal and commercial programs. I would agree with you, Mr. Chairman, and certainly Ms. Norton, that this is uh, ridiculous. During that hearing, it was disclosed that it was difficult to determine if the FEHBP health plans were receiving a, a good price for their drug benefits because of the complexity and the lack of transparency in these uh, contracts. On January 24th, I joined you, Chairman Lunch and Congressman Connolly in sponsoring H.R. 4489, the FEHB Prescription Drug Integrity, Transparency and Cost Savings Act, this bill is designed, is designed to do several very important things. Create greater uh, oversight authority to OPM relating to drug prescription drug benefits. Uh, it will also require pharmacy benefit managers to return 99 percent of all monies received from manufacturers to the FEHBP business. Cap, it will cap prices paid by the health plan to the average benefit price and require total transparency and disclosure of all contract terms and related information. However, I understand that there are some concerns around the bill in its current form, claiming a reduction in the choice and competition. Before we pass this legislation, we must look at this bill very carefully from all angles, consider all of the consequences, intentional and unintentional, and what effect it will have on our current health benefits program. The subcommittee has worked with several groups with vested interests in the legislation. The hearing will discuss this bill and specific ways to amend the bill going forward in efforts to strengthen it and ensure its intended purpose. I anxiously look forward to the testimony of today's witnesses and thank the chairman for his leadership 
And I also remind all of us that our uh, and federal employees give their blood, their sweat, their tears to support all of us. And in our economy today, every dime that they can save on prescription drugs or, any, or, or anything else is very, very important. And so with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair is, uh, now, now recognizes the distinguished chairman of our full committee, Mr. Towns of, of Brooklyn, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I don't plan to uh, use five minutes uh, because I'm actually here to thank you and, of course, Mr. Chaffet for uh, holding this hearing and to say to you, which is something you probably never heard me say before, I'm here to listen. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Northern Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. I thank the chair and thank the chair of the full committee. And the, I'm, I'm privileged and pleased to join with you, Mr. Lynch, and with you, Mr. Cummings, as an original co-sponsor of this legislation, which I think has the opportunity to create enormous efficiencies and to save hundreds of millions of dollars, potentially, in health care costs, something I think all of us can unite behind. Uh, this legislation does three things. First, it precludes a single company from controlling both the PBM and the retail pharmacy. Uh, the regulation is important because vertical integration between the two eliminates market incentives wherein the pharmacist negotiates for lower prices. Eliminating this incentive through consolidation creates market conditions in which prices will rise disproportionately. Second, the bill prohibits PBMs from switching prescription drugs without a physician's consent. This important provision ensures that federal employees and their doctors, not bureaucrats in the insurance industry, maintain control over health care. For too long, PBMs have been able to switch to more lucrative drugs without the physician approval, even if those drugs are not as efficacious or beneficial to the patient. Third, the bill requires PBMs to return 99 percent of money received from pharmaceutical manufacturers for business conducted under the FEHBP. This provision ensures that taxpayers' money is not being used to subsidize middlemen who don't actually contribute much to health care services. It also protects federal employees from predatory pricing in which PBMs have reimbursed pharmacies for less than the amount paid for the health care plan. As Dan Adcock said in NARS prepared testimony on this subject, we strongly believe that nothing should be left to chance regarding OPM's ability to access information. For that reason, we believe that transparency should ultimately be legislated. When we had hearings, it couldn't have been clearer that, frankly, we have to tighten up the regulation and oversight of PBMs to make sure that, in fact, they're delivering services, quality services for our employees and the requisite savings we know are there. I thank the Chair for holding this hearing and look forward to continued collaboration with him. I thank the gentleman. As uh, with the previous panel, Mr. Weiner, uh, you understand that it's the custom before this committee to swear all witnesses. So I want to welcome our witnesses and ask you all to rise and raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you're about to get to this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record show that all of the witnesses have each answered in the affirmative. What I'll do is uh, I'll offer a very brief introduction of each of the witnesses. Excuse me. I'll offer a brief introduction of each of our witnesses, and then uh, we will have uh, testimony from each. Mr. John O'Brien is the Director of Planning and Policy Analysis at the Office of Personnel Management. He joined, the, he joined with OPM in April of 2009. Prior to that, Mr. O'Brien was the Deputy Director for Research and Methodology at the Maryland Health Services Cost Review Commission. Mr. Patrick McFarland was nominated Inspector General of the Office of Personnel Management in 1990. As Inspector General, Mr. McFarland is responsible for providing leadership that is independent, nonpartisan, and objective, and is dedicated to identifying fraud and mismanagement in programs administered by the Office of Personnel Management. Mr. McFarland is also a member of the Council of Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency. 
Representative Sharon Treat is currently in her fifth con not consecutive term in the Maine State House of Representatives. Previously, she served four terms in the Maine State Senate, including two as Senate Majority Leader. Representative Treat is also the Executive Director of the National Legislative Association on Prescription Drug Prices, a nonpartisan organization of state legislators working jointly across state lines to reduce prescription drug prices and to expand access. Ms. Jasmine Weaver is the Healthcare Initiative's Legislative Director of Change to Win, where she has been working on health care policy, addressing issues including patient privacy, medication errors, and PBM transparency and reform. Before joining Change to Win, Jasmine worked for the chair of the House Health Care Committee in Washington State and worked on higher education policy issues at Harvard University. Mr. Jonathan Bain has been president, and, and I am pronouncing that right. Yes. Bain? Okay. Mr. Jonathan Bain is president and CEO of Argus Health Systems Incorporated since 2006. As president and CEO, Mr. Bain is responsible for all aspects of pharmacy benefit solutions offered to market by Argus Health Systems, including nearly 600 million claims processed annually and 24 percent of all Medicare Part D claims processed in the United States. Mr. Richard Beck is the Executive Director of the Texas Pharmacy Business Council, a new independent pharmacy advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring patient access to quality pharmacy care services. Mr. Beck is also the Vice President of Pharmacy Affairs at American Pharmacies, which is a member-owned independent pharmacy buying co-op. Uh, welcome to all. And uh, Mr. O'Brien, you're now recognized for five minutes. Let me uh, just back up a little bit. You see this little box in front of you, uh, the green light uh, signals that you may proceed with your testimony. A little yellow light will indicate that uh, you should probably wrap up. You've got about a minute. And then the uh, red light would uh, mean that your time has expired. Okay, thank you. Mr. O'Brien, five minutes. Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz, members of the subcommittee. Mr. O'Brien, could I ask you, and I'm going to ask everybody this, just pull those microphones right close to you so that public can hear you. Thank you. Hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz. Something wrong there. We can't. Uh, this will take a minute. Yeah, it wasn't okay. that. All right. All right. <laughs> Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz, and members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to be here on behalf of Director John Barry of the Office of Personnel Management to discuss H.R. 4489, the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, Prescription Drug Integrity, Transparency, and Cost Savings Act. I would like to submit a written statement for the record, and I will summarize briefly here. OPM commends Chairman Lynch and the subcommittee's continued efforts to strengthen the agency's oversight authority regarding FEHB prescription drug benefits. Prescription drugs represent a significant portion of the $39 billion FEHB program, comprising almost 30 percent of all expenditures, and are a valuable benefit to enrollees. In light of its importance, we are committed to ensuring that the FEHB pres prescription drug benefit is cost effective, transparent, and provides enrollees with a comprehensive quality coverage. The bill attempts to expand OPM's authority to regulate drug benefits offered by FEHB insurance carriers, including relationships with pharmacy benefits managers, pharmaceutical manufacturers, and pharmacies. The bill outlines a uniform purchasing strategy for all FEHB carriers, including price based on average manufactured price. It prohibits certain ownership relationship, restricts non-generic drug substitutions by PBMs, and requires PBM transparency and disclosure of all contract terms and related information. OPM agrees with the subcommittee that transparency and ethical business practices are an essential element of an effective FEHB prescription drug program. Since our 2005 carrier contracts, since 2005, our carrier contracts have included PBM transparency requirements. These requirements include restrictions and protocols relating to PBM drug substitutions similar to those in the bill. We are currently in the process of updating these contractual transparency requirements, and we are concerned that this bill legislates PBM pricing and purchasing terms for FEHB carriers. Requiring the use of specific contracting models and pricing methods via legislation will not allow the program flexibility in an industry where business practices are rapidly evolving. 
We believe that these models and methods would be better addressed in the contracts with our characters, carriers, allowing the program and its health plans to accommodate changing industry practices. Additionally, there may be ad administrative costs for OPM as well as carriers that would be passed on to enrollees as a result of certain sections of the bill. For example, the bill requires PBMs to comply with extensive reporting requirements to the agency, carrier, and the enrollee. While we believe that disclosure is important, a balance must be struck to ensure that these administrative requirements do not impose significant costs upon enrollees and the government. We do recognize that further efforts are needed to improve cost and pricing transparency related to the FEHB prescription drug benefits. Following this, the hearing that this committee had last June and going forward, an agency work group, including representatives of the OPM's Inspector General's Office, has been working on contracting requirements using the administrative authority currently available to us. The Inspector General's Office was instrumental in developing requirements for large providers, including PBMs, that were incorporated in 2005. Their on-site audit experience has proven very useful to the current, the current work group discussions. The work group developed a set of transparency principles to be followed when negotiating specific contracts by carriers. These principles were spelled out in OPM's February 22 carrier letter, which was sent out to carriers and has been shared with the committees. One example is requiring pass-through transparent pricing in contracts with PBMs in which the carrier receives the full value of the PBM's negotiated discounts, rebates, and other credits. We will continue to work with the OPM Inspector General to ensure that FEHB contracts are regularly updated and reflect the changing marketplace, that transparency principles are adhered to and enforceable. In addition, we are reviewing a broad range of options for improving our current contractual procedures and redesigning how prescription drugs services may be purchased. Many of the options that we are investigating were identified by this committee in its September forum. Our goal is to obtain the best and most affordable products for our enrollees. As the subcommittee continues to examine this important issue, our agency remains willing to work with you. We would be glad to provide technical assistance to address our concerns with the specific issues in the bills. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on the provisions of H.R. 4489. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Mr. McFarland, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. To best serve the committee's goals of establishing transparency and equity in the many protocols of prescription drug costs, my testimony and discussion today will attempt to contrast the work progress of OPM with the intent and vision of your proposed legislation, providing hopefully a value-added component for your final decision making. In our estimation, the single most important FEHBP issue which OPM must resolve is the fact that it is dealing with PBMs from a perspective in which the cost structure of the PBMs are utterly non-transparent. This means that there is no objective basis to determine now or in the future if the terms being offered to an FEHBP carrier by a PBM represent an advantageous arrangement. From our perspective as the agency's audit component, we find the absence of transparency to be deeply troubling. However, with the recent work progress of OPM, I believe that the agency is now moving with a firm purpose of amendment regarding the PBM industry. For years, real corrective action has been dormant at best. OPM has certainly not been a strong player in wrestling with the rising cost of prescription drugs. Today, however, Separate entities are responsible for a forward thrust of enthusiasm, namely the health care expertise of two senior advisors to the director of OPM and the strong focus and hard work of this committee to get something meaningful accomplished. Specifically, OPM, in concert with our office, will advance certain principles that will be incorporated into existing and future contracts with fee-for-service health plan carriers such as the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. These principles will require the PBMs pass all discounts, rebates, and other financial incentives or payments through to the carriers, and that the PBMs only remuneration in connection with the contract is from the FEHBP carrier itself. In effect, the drug cost passed through the carrier would be based on the cost of the drug plus a reasonable fee for the PBM services such as administrative fees. All relevant documents, including contracts with drug manufacturers, would be available to my office for audit. 
If these principles are quickly and properly implemented by OPM, I believe most, if not all, of my concerns about the lack of transparency in the FEHPP PBM contracts will be resolved. However, as always, the devil is in the details. For example, without additional resources, it is difficult to see how OPM will be able to fully implement these principles. Also, I am concerned that the existing PBM contracts may be allowed to continue for years before the new principles are incorporated. It may be more prudent to require the fee-for-service carriers to comply with the principles no later than 2012 plan year. Finally, I am concerned that the principles may be changed before they are incorporated into the FEHBP FFS contracts. Presently, there are several proposed contract changes that serve to implement the principles being introduced into the FEHBP's pharmacy benefit program. The revisions are grouped into the following categories. Pricing requirements, document access, electronic data access, the selling of utilization data, financial benefit administration, and sanctions. I have also several minor concerns with the Act itself. For example, OPM, OPM may not have the resources or expertise to determine maximum allowable dispensing fees. The heading civil monetary penalties is somewhat confusing because the section deals primarily with False Claims Act rather than civil monetary penalties. The ability of PBMs to retain 1% of rebates may result in current discount arrangements being converted to rebates. Providing incentives to PBMs to reduce overall drug cost is an excellent strategy. However, legislation should be careful not to strictly limit incentive options. It is questionable whether interim final regulations can be issued within six months of enactment because of the complexity of the subject matter and the lack of agency resources. Despite my concerns, the status quo must be changed. I believe that the amendment to the Federal Employees Health Benefit Act on pharmacy benefits can be beneficial, particularly if OPM does not quickly require FFS, FEHPP carriers to enter into the PBM contracts that require clear-cut pass, clear pass-through transparent pricing. A pass-through pricing model, in our opinion, would be easier to administer and fair to all parties. All this having been said, I would respectfully suggest that during further deliberations, this committee might give favorable consideration to the following, that the principles presently being proposed by OPM be also addressed in this legislation. My primary concern for making this request is that if, in fact, OPM may be directed to be an integral part of the health care reform, said inclusion of these stated principles in legislation would guarantee that the issue would remain a high priority. In closing, I want to express a most noteworthy thank you to this committee for this proposed legislation. Regardless of the outcome, whether it be enacted into law or a decision is made to allow OPM's substantive proposals to prevail, I can state firsthand that this Office of Inspector General, especially our entire audit staff, applauds this particular pursuit of accountability resulting in better government. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Representative Sharon Treat, I bid you welcome, and you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Lynch and members of the subcommittee, my name is Sharon Treat. I'm an attorney, a member of the House of Representatives in the state of Maine, and director of the National Legislative Association on Prescription Drug Prices, where I work with over 400 legislators who receive our uh, electronic newsletter and provide information around the country on a variety of uh, prescription drug legislation, but uh, a good deal of it focused on pharmacy benefit managers. I hope to provide a bit of a state perspective on H.R. 4489, which I wholeheartedly support, and also to, also to offer a few uh, suggestions which I think would improve the legislation and assure its effectiveness. In 2003, I sponsored Maine's PBM law, which was the first in the country to very comprehensively regulate 
uh, pharmacy benefit managers, imposing a fiduciary duty and requiring PBMs to disclose possible conflicts of interest and pass through to their clients, Good including point. the state of Maine and the state employee health plan, the full monetary value of the rebates that they negotiate. At least 18 states and the District of Columbia now ha require oversight and or regulation of pharmacy benefit managers. These vary uh, from very prescriptive legislation to, to fairly minimal uh, registration provisions. The states are responding to the nearly absent federal role re regulating PBMs and the PBM business model that relies on secrecy, convoluted payment transactions that virtually no one can understand, and uh, a model that is rife with conflicts of interest. I note that the main legislation that I worked on, uh, I did with our then Attorney General Steve Rowe at a time when we had a consent decree ongoing with MEDCO, which imposed many of the same provisions into uh, the consent decree. The federal district court decision which upheld the main law, which all, actually went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which denied cert, uh, stated, I think, uh, particularly well what the problems are with the PBM business model, and it addressed the advantages of regulation. The court stated, whether and how a PBM actually saves an individual benefits provider money with respect to the purchase of a particular prescription drug is largely a mystery to the benefits provider. This lack of transparency also has a tendency to undermine a benefit provider's ability to determine which is the best proposal among competing proposals from a PBM. For example, if a benefits provider has proposals from three different PBMs for pharmacy benefits management services, each guaranteeing a particular dollar amount of rebate per prescription, the PBM proposal offering the highest rebate for each prescription filled could actually be the worst proposal as far as net savings are concerned because that PBM might have to do, have a deal with a manufacturer that gives it an incentive to sell or restrict its formulary to the most expensive drugs. Yep. In other words, although PBMs afford a valuable bundle of services to benefit providers, they also introduce a layer of fog to the market that prevents benefit providers from fully understanding how best to minimize their net prescription drug costs. I would note that H.R. 4489 appropriately addresses many of these issues, including drug switching, failure to pass through the re value of rebates and other discounts, discriminatory practices towards independent pharmacies, and lack of transparency. Based on the state's experience, regulation of federal PBM contracts will reduce employee health insurance costs and avoid consumer harms caused by drug switching, errors, and conflicts of interest. Uh, nonetheless, I believe there is room for improvement in this legislation. And one thing I would just parenthetically note, uh, in reading through the um, background materials on this legislation, Pharmacy costs making up 25% of this federal health employee plan is uh, the fee for service plan is a very high percentage uh, spent on pharmacy. It is really out of uh, whack when you look at what the percentage is in other programs, other uh, policies na nationwide in terms of a percentage of health care costs and also uh, Medicaid. Um, so specifically what uh, I think this legislation should be doing though in addition is that I think that the uh, conflict of interest provisions need to be tightened up. It's great that the legislation requires, uh, prevents conflicts that involve a controlling interest. However, there are many conflicts of interest built into the PBM business model which result in higher prices or have other negative impacts which don't rise to a controlling interest. At the very least, H.R. 4489 should explicitly require PBMs to disclose in writing quote, any activity, policy, or practice that directly or indirectly presents any conflict of interest. This is language currently in Maine law, so you won't be breaking any ground. And then, in addition, we would ask that you consider adding a fiduciary duty provision to ensure that a PBM is actually acting on behalf of the plan. For That's example, great. Maine law requires a PBM to perform its duties with care, skill, prudence, and diligence in accordance with the standards of conduct applicable to a fiduciary in an enterprise of like character with like aims. 
In conclusion, I commend the sponsor for tackling this important and rather difficult issue and taking a comprehensive approach. We look forward to working with you and making sure that comprehensive legislation is enacted that will cut the cost of prescription drugs for federal employees. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Ms. Jasmine Weaver, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch and members of the committee. My name is Jasmine Weaver, and I am the Health Care Initiative's Legislative Director at Change to Win, a six million member partnership of five unions, SEIU, USCW, Teamsters, the Laborers, and the Farm Workers. Four of our five affiliate unions represent federal workers, and our members across the country are facing rising prescription drug costs. So we have a strong interest in improving the FEHBP and the PBM industry. We are thrilled to be here today to voice our unqualified support for H.R. 4489. We believe this bill will save federal workers and the federal government hundreds of millions of dollars, and we thank Chairman Lynch and the subcommittee for your work on this important issue. This bill is necessary because although PBMs can provide a useful service, they are also in a position of trust that makes it possible for them to engage in a variety of troubling practices. First, many PBMs provide virtually no transparency to the health plans that they serve. Refusing to disclose such basic information as you've heard today as how much they pay for the drugs that they help provide. Second, some PBMs engage in spread pricing, charging the health plans they serve more for the drugs than they pay pharmacies that then distribute those drugs to patients. Third, PBMs may also switch a patient's drug to a drug other than the ones their doctor prescribed, a drug more expensive for the health plan and the patient, because that PBM is getting rebates from drug manufacturers. And finally, some PBMs have merged with retail drug stores or drug manufacturers, creating serious conflicts of interest. This bill addresses all of these problems. It, uh, it, it totally um, enhances transparency. It bans spread pricing. It prohibits drug switching that is designed solely to enhance the profits of a PBM. And it reduces conflicts of interest in FEHBP drug contracting by extending OPM's current ban on PBM contracts that are with a PBM that is owned by a drug man manufacturer to also extend that ban to PBMs that are owned by retail drug stores. By fixing these problems, this bill should significantly reduce drug costs for federal employees and the federal government. Although the FEHBP is the largest employer-sponsored health plan in the country and thus should receive the best prices, as you've heard today, it's currently spending 15 to 45 percent more for prescription drugs than other federal programs. Many other government plans and private employers have saved millions by switching to more transparent PBM contracting. The federal government cannot afford to pass up these savings, as the FEHBP currently spends over $10 billion a year on prescription drugs for the FEHBP. Change to Win recently released a report that further highlights the need for this bill. Our report focused on CVS Caremark, a PBM drugstore combination that currently manages 80% of the pharmacy benefit within the FEHBP. CVS offers a generic discount program that any person can sign up for. After paying $10, you get access to hundreds of generic drugs for $9.99. So we compared this $9.99 price to the price that federal employees and the federal government pay under the Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal Employee Program, which is the largest health plan within the FEHBP. What we found is that remarkably, FEP members and the government together pay more than $9.99 for 85% of the drugs on this discount generic list and sometimes far more, up to $200 more for the exact same drug. Thus, FEP members and the government are actually made worse off by using their insurance to buy these drugs. This underscores the need for greater transparency in the FEHBP. It is hard to imagine that OPM and federal employees would agree to this situation if they knew what they were really being charged. In fact, a recent poll of FEHBP members found that 74% of them think that more should be done to lower costs of their the cost of their prescription drugs. And 73% of plan members surveyed would support legislation to do this. In conclusion, the reforms in this bill take the FEHBP a huge step forward, and that's why we wholeheartedly support it. Thank you for your time.
Thank you. Mr. Baim, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. Again, my name is Jonathan Baim, and I'm President and CEO of Argus Health System. Uh, Argus is one of the largest pharmacy benefit administrators, processing over 500 million claims in each of the last four years. Uh, this total includes a significant portion of Medicare Part D. We process 24% of all Part D claims in the United States. We process claims for customers with 5 million Part D members and 25 million commercial members. Our business model, however, is very different than many of our competitors. We generally offer services on a fee-for-service, fully disclosed, auditable basis. We f refer to our model as a transparent model, and we've been doing business this way since 1999. To provide context regarding transparency in the pharmacy benefit, let me define what I mean by transparency. David Calabrese stated May 1st, 2006 issue of Managed Care Executive, true transparency is a model in which all PBM revenue streams are fully disclosed to the payer, the full value of retail and mail order pharmacy discounts is passed on to the client, data is shared with the client, and the client is given ultimate decision-making control over its drug benefit design and formulary management. At Argus, we embrace this business model in this definition. In our transparent model, we provide fully auditable access to data, enabling our customers to comprehensively manage their business for the benefit of their members. Consistently, our customers have told us when they transition to our model from a traditional PBM, they save 8 to 10 percent on their drug spend day one. Our customers achieve generic dispensing rates of well over 70 percent compared to mid 60 percent industry averages because access to their data enables them to make more informed decisions and work with providers and members to achieve the desired expense and health outcomes. Another difference in the Argus transparent model is we do not own a mail order facility or drive members to mail order. Rather, we support 90-day prescription strategies that support mail order and 90 days at retail, whatever method the member deems most convenient for them. This is a significant difference from PBMs that own mail order and drive utilization to this distribution method regardless of member preference. There clearly are divergent views regarding the impact of transparency on managing the pharmacy benefit. This committee has heard and I've reviewed testimony, testimony from both sides of the argument. After reviewing available federal government related material, it is clear there's no consensus regarding the impact of transparency on ultimate cost. There have been reports of estimated increased costs, unknown impact on cost, and the CBO recently scored the Cantwell transparency amendment as budget neutral. The position that the disclosure of sensitive price information would negatively impact negotiating leverage with pharmaceutical manufacturers and pharmacies appears to be predicated on the premise that this information would be generally available for public consumption. This bill clearly treats this information as confidential and can only be used by OPM and I think invalidates the premise that it would raise costs. The final point that I would make regarding the importance of transparency is I would suggest that in, it is more important in the pharmacy benefit management than it, even in other industries. And that's because the products and services are not procured at a specific price, but rather a pricing construct. And uh, without visibility into the true costs and rebate arrangements, the pricing construct can not only not be validated or audited, but it is invalid by the premise that it is based on the unknowable. The Inspector General Patrick McFarland testified before this committee in June and reiterated again today that the single most important issue which OPM must resolve is that PBMs are utterly non-transparent. He went on to say that we find the absence of transparency to be deeply troubling. In conclusion, it is my view that effective management of pharmacy benefits is fundamental to reducing prescription drug costs and improving the quality of health care outcomes in both the public and private sector. Effective management of this benefit is dependent on transparent access to the relevant information. Chairman Lynch, it is my view, given our customers' experience as well as my research into the issues, that your proposed legislation will be beneficial to OPM by enabling them to have access to information so better decisions regarding health care costs and outcome management can be made on behalf of the federal employees and ultimately the taxpayers. The confidentiality provision that you have included 
will mitigate the risk that disclosure of sensitive price information will result in increased costs to administer prescription benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bain. Mr. Becker, now recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch and members of the subcommittee. My name is Richard Beck, and I'm testifying here before you today on behalf of the National Community Pharmacists Association in support of H.R. 4489. NCPA represents the interests of pharmacist owners, managers, and employees of more than 22,700 independent pharmacies across the U.S. And we appreciate the opportunity to address the topic of pharmacy benefits management regulation. I'm also executive director of the Texas Pharmacy Business Council, which represents approximately 1,700 community pharmacies in Texas. Today, I will share with you the reasons we support this bill, as well as some of our experiences and lessons learned from our PBM advocacy activities in the state of Texas. Both NCPA and TPBC have long championed the need for both federal and state oversight of pharmacy benefit managers. That is because our members and their patients continue to face significant problems in dealing with these unregulated entities. PBMs have been permitted to operate virtually unchecked since their inception, slowed only by the increasing amount of litigation alleging fraudulent and deceptive practices filed against the PBMs each year, including the federal government. First, I would like to speak in support of H.R. 4489, a crucial piece of legislation that would provide OPM with greater insight into the inner workings of the various PBMs that currently manage the prescription drug benefits for FEHBP. That is a tough one in insurance. <laughs> so, we strongly support H.R. 4489 for many reasons. It would require the reporting and pass through of the rebates that PBMs receive from manufacturers. It would expose some of the questionable practices that PBMs frequently engage in, including repackaging and assigning different reimbursement rates for drugs dispensed by their own mail order pharmacies. It prohibit PBM ownership of retail pharmacies, thereby eliminating the inherent conflicts of interest that results in higher costs and impaired quality of care. One has to look no further to justify this than prohibition than looking at the anti-competitive and anti-consumer activities exhibited by the CVS Caremark Corporation uh, merger. Let me now talk about our experiences in the state of Texas and how our legislature and governor have been supportive of PBM transparency and state contracts. A few years ago, the state of Texas concluded that the disclosure of the business practices of PBMs and their dealings with government entities is essential to ensuring that the government entity is receiving high quality, cost effective services. In 2006, a joint legislative committee issued a report that detailed many of the questionable drug prices used by the PBMs and recommend the state take, take steps to ensure that they were getting the most bang for their buck with regard to PBM services. Representative Treat testified before that committee. Uh, the state auditor followed up with its own study in 2008 and delved more deeply into the specific PBM contracts held by various state agencies. The results of the study clearly indicated that the state agencies needed to include in all future PBM contracts provisions that clearly specified the costs, discounts, and other fees associated with services provided by the PBM, as well as provisions that would preserve their ability to audit the PBM. In 2009, after several years of considering various pieces of legislation, legislature passed PBM transparency legislation. The passage of Senate Bill 704 now enables Texas state agencies to share the terms and conditions of their PBM contracts with other state agencies, as well as grants them full audit rights over those contracts. In Texas, we plan to pursue follow-up legislation to build upon the 2009 legislation. The Texas PBM studies and consideration of related legislation has provided an invaluable education to state legislators and decision makers alike about the need for PBM regulation and has had a positive impact on the con content of terms of subsequent PBM contracts in the state of Texas. The Texas State Employees Retirement System, who initially, along with CVS Caremark, opposed the 2007 PBM transparency legislation in Texas, recently reported that the terms of their contract include many of the elements of that legislation, including 100% pass-through of rebates, and is projecting a 260 million savings over four years. 
Curiously, although CVS Caremark has apparently agreed to these contract provisions, they and other large PBMs still continue to oppose legislation to recognize these same principles in state and federal law. In conclusion, I strongly urge you to pass the bill before you today. The PBM industry, as they've done in Texas, is likely to use scare tactics in an effort to convince you and the American taxpayers that transparency may be harmful and expensive and that they require secrecy to administer the drug benefits of FEHBP. There is simply no credible evidence that transparency has increased costs or will do so in the future. I urge you to reject this paradoxical reasoning and insist that OPM be afforded the disclosures necessary to negotiate a fair contract in order to curb unnecessary prescription drug spending. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beck. I want to thank you all for your very helpful testimony. Uh, let me begin. I yield myself uh, five minutes. Uh, it is confounding at best uh, to, to listen to the arguments of, uh, of some of the opponents of this bill to say that uh, as they have in the past, that uh, transparency is overrated and that, uh, that somehow if we let people know what things cost, then prices are going to go up. Uh, Ms. Treat, you've been, you've been terrific uh, in, in offering some very helpful suggestions uh, uh, to improve our legislation, and, and we really do appreciate that. Uh, let me ask you. Uh, you, you, you you hit right on uh, the point of fiduciary responsibility and, and, and putting fiduciary responsibility on our PBMs so that their duty is clear and, and, and the duty is uh, enforceable on the part of, uh, of the subscriber, in this case, the federal employee. How do you see this? Uh, this conflict that we have here, uh, at least in the case of uh, CVS Caremark, where we have uh, the same, well, we have the PBM owned, the PBM which, you know, I believe even now without the legislation has, has a duty uh, to the federal employee to get the best price, while at the same time they are owned by a pharmacy chain that is trying to drive people in the door to, to maximize profit, which is, which is clearly, a, you know, that, that is a fine and, and noble and, uh, you know, uh, capitalistic uh, motive, but it, it seems that, at least to me, that those interests are in conflict. And I think that your, your suggestion of imply, or, or imposing a fiduciary responsibility on the part of the PBM gets right at that conflict. Uh, could, you, could you offer your own thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I sponsored the legislation back in 2003. It took several years in and out of the courts, actually, and it was the fiduciary provision that was litigated uh, and it related to ERISA plans, something you don't have a problem with in this case. Uh, nonetheless, we won that litigation. But that uh, bill came out of a similar situation involving a drug manufacturer, Merck, which th at that time owned uh, Medco. And so you had a conflict of interest between a manufacturer with whom uh, the PBM was supposedly negotiating uh, good uh, discounts and rebates uh, on behalf of the, whoever hired them. Uh, and um, you know, a drug company which had a, 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 uh, a, a appropriate goal of maximizing its profits. And I think that there's a very similar problem now where you have retail pharmacies and PBMs which also uh, their ownership overlaps. Uh, we see now that one of the fastest growing segments of the uh, pharmaceutical drug spin is for specialty drugs. Uh, and there's a real effort on the part of a number of entities to get into that market and to have controlling or partial interests uh, in the spe specialty drug pharmacy area. Um, there are a number of areas where there could be conflicts of interest that would um, perhaps dissuade a PBM from perhaps negotiating the toughest deal they could uh, right. with those entities. And I think the reason that 
uh, I'm really recommending looking at the language that you use in, in uh, asking for disclosure on conflicts of interest and perhaps having something of a catch-all provision with the, the fiduciary language is that we cannot know today what new business models uh, are going to be dreamt up tomorrow. Right. And we often know that legislation that we pass and regulation that we pass ends up, you know, a response is, well, what's a good way to get around that to do something different? And I think the value of the main language is that it is designed to not enumerate every single possible conflict of interest in advance, but to have general enough language that if something arises in the future, it will be addressed. Right, that's great. Thank you very much. My time has pretty much expired. I was neglectful, however, in, in failing to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray, earlier for an opening statement and, and questions. So, Mr. Bill Bray, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just curiosity. Um, uh, Representative Treat, um, what's the population of Maine today, just for my own? It has been hovering around 1.3 million for the past decades, many decades. Thank you. That's why everybody keeps moving out and coming over. Visit us in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> just shows you how the shift has gone. Our county is 3.5 million, but the population, the way it shifts. I just trying to remember the sizes here. I understand Texas, yours was. As a former legis uh, a local legislator, I'm interested in a lot of how these work and how the process works through different levels. I thank the gentleman. Uh, chair recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McFarland, you, you have in your testimony some, some uh, claims costs per member, and you, 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 you note them um, uh, increasing almost twice the amount paid in. 1999 compared to what? How would that compare to claims costs um, uh, for other programs? Or are there figures that would allow us to, to measure those increases? Uh, you say, for example, drug costs increased, increases average 13.5%. Uh, that's costs as opposed to claim costs per member. But in either case, um, uh, how do those compare with those not in, in a program like the uh, prescription drug program of the uh, FEHBP? Is it Mr. O'Brien? Yeah. In terms of the, the, the um, pharmacy costs for the FEHB program compared to um, other programs that would exist, one issue that needs to be clear is um, it was stated earlier that the FEHB share of pharmacy spend compared to a large private employer appears very high. Um, that is always the case because the FEHP program includes the coverage of federal retirees, which a typical private program would not. Say uh, the federal program is what? The federal program includes federal retirees, for in which case we are, most of their costs are in fact drug costs. So our percentage of drug costs relative to a large company. Most will, of whose costs are drug costs? I'm sorry. Much of fe most federal retirees, those who are over. Oh, because 65. of retirees. Yes. So our drug costs. Well, appear. isn't that true for many for, for many programs, retirees as well as as uh, current employees are, are in the same program? The, FE the FEHB program is somewhat unique in that the, all our, when you look at our total costs, the retiree cost is with all the other costs in there. So the statement that our pharmacy spend as a percentage is very high is really comparing apples and oranges. So uh, have you ever, uh, uh, I see, since they're all in the same program, yeah. I, I understand. Uh, I, I am somewhat confused by your testimony, Mr. McFarlane, because um, it, it, it seems to say, let us do it, we're, we're doing it, but there's a section of the, of the testimony where it does say that we will need some legislation, and it, you seem to pose the legislation mostly because there were administrative costs, which leads me to to ask what about the, the administrative costs that are built into uh, o, what OPM, uh, yes, what OPM does with FEHBP. Well, my understanding of... Uh, I mean, are you in fact doing what uh, the Lynch Bill does, uh, s perhaps uh, stimulated by the Lynch Bill, or do you concede that we do need legislation? As I, as I said in my, my testimony, 
uh, the previous testimony that's on record and, and uh, the shortened version that uh, was uh, made today is that the, I would suggest uh, that what OPM is presently doing, and that is that, that they are identifying the principles that are very important to, to making transparency happen, that those principles uh, per se be considered to be put in the legislation uh, that is present, that we are uh, presently discussing. So in, in no way did I say that we shouldn't have legislation. So you're I'm, saying it, my it's important enough to have them and, and to have them uh, in statutory language. Well, and, and my particular reason for suggesting that is that if by chance the uh, direction is given to OPM to be an integral player in the health reform uh, act, then I think that so much could, could uh, fall between the cracks. And if it's in legislation, I think that that probably would be uh, very helpful to, to maintain its, its priority. In, in, in DOD and VA, uh, are, are there multiple plans uh, to choose from as uh, with FEHBP? No, I don't believe that they have the same uh, program that we do. Well, no, I didn't they're, ask that. They're, I'm sure they don't, but I'm saying they're yeah, limited. They, buy, they, buy, they, buy, they buy as a single customer. I'm asking that for those who subscribe, uh, is there one plan and only one plan or, or, or in, in, for, for, for DOD and for, for VA? Well, I think the DOD and, and the VA have, have different approaches to their uh, prescription drugs than what, what we're talking about for the FEHBP. Mr. Chairman, I realize my time is up, but I, I, I do need to know. Yeah, I do need to know uh, whether Give me another, I, you another two minutes. Thank you. I, I, I do need to know if, if veterans, if uh, the vast, uh, the, the largest part of the bureaucracy, the DOD, uh, maybe they are so different that they really are apples and oranges. If so, I'd like you to explain. Well, the, the DOD and, and the VA, they each, they each have their separate plans. Well, I understand staff says that, that is it VA that has three or four plans? Uh, I, I, what I'm trying to find out, if, if they have multiple plans, is, uh, uh, and I, perhaps this information uh, could be transmitted to the chairman, uh, I am wondering how they keep, how they do transparency, how they assure. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure at all that they are able to identify transparency. Well, then I'd ask you to find out. That is to say, I'm very bothered by the fact that such a large percentage of the prescription drug dollar is, in fact, in another section of the federal government. And I simply want to know if there's something we can learn from them or if we are reinventing the wheel here. Uh, uh, and, and, and if so, then that has to be the case. Uh, Mr. O'Brien? Yeah, just Congresswoman Norton, uh, thank you. Um, again, you know, urged on by uh, this committee, OPM staff has in fact met with DOD and the individuals who run the TRICARE program to try and learn about how their pharmacy program works. It is a much more of a, a single contract for pharmacy benefits that they run nationwide with separate regional subcontracts. Uh, it again, we are actively studying it, and we have had that some very good feedback from the TRICARE folks, and it is a very interesting model that we are learning a lot more about. And you think that some of that model may be, may be transferable to some of what you're trying to do I, today? Back to, we are, I, again, we are actively studying that, as well as the other options that were offered by this committee in its forum in September. We haven't completed our analysis, but we are actively looking at it, and when we have completed, we look forward to working with you more on those issues. But thank, thank you, you Mr. Chairman. It's, 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 it's becoming, it, I thank you, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the additional time, because it's becoming more and more difficult, uh, given the scarcity of federal dollars, for us to rationale, rationalize different treatment of large sections of the federal budget for essentially the same purpose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. Uh, yielding myself five minutes. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, 
Uh, part of your, your testimony is, a little, is, is more than a little disappointing, I think, uh, for us in that uh, previous testimony from OPM has, has been uh, of a similar vein. Uh, at one point, one of the witnesses from OPM said that, uh, and this is a quote, transparency is, is overrated. And that's a tough thing for an oversight com committee to hear. Uh, <laughs> We, we are uh, intensely interested uh, in getting to the bottom of what, what costs actually are for, for our, our health care system. And uh, I know that you came out with, a, with a, a very positive carrier letter yesterday, though, yesterday, uh, in, in, in advance of this hearing. And I, I, sometimes I feel like I'm pulling you folks along towards the road of reform. and. Uh, you know, I just wish we were working more closely together trying to get to the same, uh, the same object, and, and that troubles me uh, somewhat. And I'm concerned that the agency has become captive to the current system and is resistant to change. Uh, as you heard Mr. McFarland say, the most troubling aspect of, of the current FEHBP program is the, the utter lack of transparency how it is so opaque and so complex. Uh, we are not mapping the genome here. We are selling pharmaceuticals to federal employees. In my other capacity on the Financial Services Committee, I'm dealing with complex derivatives, currency default swaps, credit default swaps, financial engineering that is inc increasingly and incredibly complex. It pales in comparison to what we got going on here in selling pharmaceuticals to federal employees. That's all we're doing here. And we've got this construct that is just, uh, it's, it's just mind boggling and mind numbing. And I think it, that's exactly the way it was, uh, uh, you know, that's why it was constructed the way it is, is to, to resist uh, change, you know, the, uh, it, it resists the, the threat of being understood by its complexity. And uh, we're, we're trying to drill down and straighten this up, and we need, we need your help. We really do. Uh, this current system, we just got to blow it up and get rid of it and get on to something else, because this is not working for the American taxpayer. You know, I, I think the estimate uh, that Ms. Weaver has put out there of, uh, of uh, several hundred millions of dollars in savings uh, being that's probably conservative, what I see here. I think it's probably closer to a billion dollars what we can save. Uh, in, in light of the, the difference in formularies that we've pointed out here this morning, what we're paying, we have eight million participants. And we don't use that, that collective uh, clout, that buying power at all in our, in our systems. And we allow uh, these PBMs to really abuse what I think is a, uh, you know, is honorable service by our federal employees. We're just letting them, you know, take advantage of us, and we cannot do that anymore. Our budget will not allow it. So we got to find some savings, and, and if we're looking for waste, fraud, and abuse, the FBHBP is a target-rich environment because of the arrangements that we've got going on here. This stinks. If I was a hound dog, I'd be pointing right here. Here's where some savings are. Here is where some waste, fraud, and abuse is going on, and I know it. And we're trying to dig down and, and get at it. And, you know, we could save the taxpayer a ton of money. We could bring a, a more competitive model and, and better serve. Look, we have wonderful federal employees. I'm an advocate for federal employees. Now, they do wonderful work. They, they provide a, a, a valuable public service. And we cannot let, let this go on. This is just unacceptable. We can't do this anymore. So I'm really looking for your help. And I know we got a new director over there, uh, Mr. Berry, who is, who's on the right. He's, you know, he's, he's part of the solution. He's not part of the problem. He's part of the solution. But we've got some inertia over there. Inertia at best, and then resistance at, at worst. And we, we've got we've to get at it. Uh, since I'm the chairman and no other witnesses, I'm going to extend myself another five minutes. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, l let me ask you, uh, Mr. 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 Bame, you you've been terrific on this, and you have a unique perspective. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, 
In terms of transparency, uh, you know, the, the, you, you, you addressed this in part in, in your original testimony about the, uh, the fear that, well, the, the concern that's been raised by the PBMs that if, if people know what they're paying for, then prices will go up and it'll destroy competition. But uh, can, you, can you talk a bit more about your own experience and, and, uh, and also about some of the protections in the bill so that this is not publicly available information uh, that would undermine their, their uh, competitive advantage? Yeah, the, the argument, as I understand it, that Sorry. The argument, that, as I understand it, they put forth is that if the information is publicly available, that the competitors, the manufacturers, and the other chains would actually increase their prices uh, because they'd have more information available. Uh, it's a difficult argument to debate because it's not publicly available now. In many other industries, I think we've seen transparency lowers costs, not raise it. But rather than debate that particular topic, I think the most important thing is you have provisions in your bill that make it only available for OPM's use. It's not posted on websites, so the manufacturers can't see what the deals are. So I don't think there's any risk in the way you've uh, constructed your confidentiality that it would be publicly available information. And then I'd question, even if it was publicly available, whether that really would increase cost. Because again, I think you can go through n a number of retail markets. You can look at computers on the internet, you can look at cars as more transparent pricing information has been made available, costs generally go down in those environments. But rather than debate the economic principle, I think you can just protect against the disclosure of the information. Okay. Mr. Beck, you mentioned uh, that your experience uh, in Texas, uh, I wrote down $260 million in four years. What's the size of, uh, of your uh, we have 800, uh, excuse me, we have 8 million uh, participants. What's the size of the uh, market there for the You know, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm not real sure. I know it's, it's extremely large. Uh, yeah. And I think that estimate is low. And I agree with you. I think that the, the uh, estimate is a little short at half a billion. I think it's over a billion. Yeah. Uh, one thing I, I wanted to mention, you know, back in 2002, there was a lawsuit brought by the federal FEHBP uh, and I believe the mail carriers, I was reviewing it this morning, um, uh, against Advanced PCS, which was, is... Was that uh, mail handlers? Uh, mail handlers, yes, sir. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, Advanced PCS, which is now no longer, it was bought by CVS Caremark. And out of that was a $179 million settlement. Uh, in addition to that, there were provisions in the settlement that was a five-year requirement for transparency standards to be followed. So basically, and that has now expired. So basically, your legislation just extends that federal lawsuit settlement and puts it in legislation that has to do with all the PBM contracts. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to, you know, Ms. Weaver, I, I think you've, you mentioned some of this in your testimony about uh, drug switching and uh, the abuses. You, you, you laid out that very uh, cogent analysis between uh, what, what, uh, Folks were paying for that formulary, the 999 comparison. Can you drill down that a little bit and uh, you know uh, elaborate on on that analysis that you came up with? Absolutely. So essentially, what we did is we took CVS. CVS's generic discount program, which is a list of over 300 drugs that they offer for 999. And it's, you know, as we've, everybody said today, it's very hard to figure out what drugs cost, right? So you need uh, a, be a baseline to figure out if you're getting a good deal. So one of the reasons we decided to look at this is this is a baseline. It's the walk-up price. You pay $10 to join this program, and anybody can get access to 300-plus generic drugs for $9.99. So what we wanted to do was look at, okay, Blue Cross Blue Shield's FEP program. It's the largest plan within the FEHBP. 
we can compare the prices that the government and those federal employees are paying for the, every single one of the, we, we tested every drug on that list. And what we found, as I mentioned, was that 85% of the drugs on the list cost the federal government or federal employees and or sometimes both, it depends on the uh, cost structures, uh, more than that 999 price. Uh, so there's a little bit the- So the, the people with insurance are paying more than the people without insurance. Exactly. Yeah. For 80, for 85 percent of the drugs on the list. How wacky is that? It's pretty wacky. Yeah, <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, I just I cannot. And uh, we actually, I mean, we've we've heard from federal employees that actually don't use their insurance when they when they go into a retail store uh, because they know that they can get a better deal, and and that's pretty absurd as well because those people are paying premiums that are supposed to give them prescription drug coverage. Right, so they're paying really premiums, and the American yeah. taxpayer is paying 72 percent of that plan in addition to what the the user is 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 paying. So. That, that's what got me uh, absolutely furious over, over what's going on here. Uh, Mr. McFarland, I appreciate your, your, uh, your work on this. This has been tough. And you, you've, uh, you know, you've expressed at earlier hearings your frustration in, in being able to turn, to turn to Herman, uh, you know, what, what, what we're getting for our money and what, what, uh, whether there's an advantage here. Uh, being had by the Federal uh, Employee Health Benefit Plan and its 8 million participants in our arrangement with these PBMs. Uh, is there anything that's not in the bill that you think might help your position in terms of understanding what's going on behind the scenes and, uh, you know, the, the, the real cost between all these relationships, the uh, the commissions, the rebates, and that, that whole relationship between manufacturers and PBMs, and then uh, pharmacies as well. Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't think that there's anything particular that uh, should be additionally placed in the bill. I think, it's, I think it's very complete as it is. That doesn't mean that there might not be some, after further deliberation, some some uh, more thinking about about uh, add-ons, but at, at this point, I, I wouldn't say any anything specific. What what we're dealing with, I think, your bill clearly covers, clearly. Uh, let, if I can, let let me make make a point on something that was Please. presented to me earlier today when we were discussing, as we have been for a few weeks, the preparing for the testimony today. Uh, this is just a little excerpt from uh, the audit staff, what they noticed Af after uh, the large provider agreement was brought into effect, uh, I think, in 2005. And that simply meant to us that we were able then to, to get into those PBM contracts. But as it turned out, it was only in a compliance mode. We still could not get to where we needed to be. With, with that large provider requirement. And my understanding of the large provider uh, requirement was, uh, agreement was simply whoever ends up paying at least 5%, then, then they would consider a large provider. And uh -huh. of course, the, the uh, prescription drugs, 25 or more percent. So that, that was an easy uh, identification there. But here's what was, uh, was given to me. This is from the audit staff. We have noticed a distinct shift in how the PBMs have contracted with FEHBP carriers. What we saw as pass-through pricing initially with administrative fees and rebates returned did a complete 180 degrees. After the large provider agreement, the contracts became based on a percentage off of the average wholesale price for the drugs with no administrative fees charged and the PBM keeping most if not all of the rebates. Because the drugs are priced off a percentage of the AWP, our audits consisted of verifying the price charged to the FEHBP. However, we could not compare that price to the actual price paid by the PBM. Right. So it was just 
you know, uh, well, an Well, they went, yeah, I, I understand what they're doing there. Uh, the, the average wholesale price is a moving target. It's different. It means something different to everybody. So you don't have a, you don't have a solid benchmark there by which you can, you can make that determination. What we're actually looking for here is the actual price. Yes. How much? How much? How much the actual cost is, and how much we're being charged, and that's all we want to know. We're, we're not, you know, we just want a fair deal. That's all, and one that we we can understand on behalf of the people that we represent. And we can't get there uh, with the way this thing's working right now. Well, we we presently receive uh, confidential proprietary information from the PBMs as a database uh, on on prescription uh, claims. And we protect that uh, with our heart and soul. Yeah. We, we make sure that that is as safe, safe as possible in our particular environs. But then on the other hand, they are saying, but you don't need to see our financial records, but we can also, we, but we can give you the uh, personal identification information of, of our claims people. So it's, you know, saying one thing and, and doing another. That's right. That's exactly right. You know, some of the information that's being sold out there and marketed is uh, quite detailed, so it's, it's uh, counterintuitive that they can't give it to you in, in a form that you can use. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think you people have suffered enough. Uh, and I, I want to thank you. On behalf of the committee, we've got a lot going on here today. As you know, there's a few uh, major hearings going on here. I want to thank you for coming before this committee and helping us with our work. Uh, uh, I would like the opportunity to continue to work with you. And look, we, we aren't, I am not saying that our legislation is perfect, not, not by any means. That's why we're having this hearing, and that's why we're trying to get input from you. And I think, actually, you've, you've all uh, been helpful in making this legislation better. And uh, we, we appreciate your, your testimony and your, your help with this. And uh, uh, we're going to allow members who may have had questions uh, to offer you uh, uh, inquiries uh, that you'll, if you're willing, uh, we'd have to have you respond in writing within five days if members so choose. Uh, but other than that, I want to thank you for your attendance today and you're free to go. Thank you. Thank you. And can we ask our second panel to, to come up? A uh, th third panel, excuse me. Here on behalf of U.S. Perg, I think one of our coalition allies, Mr. David Balto, had originally. I'm going to testify. Larry McNeely, pleasure to meet you. Jack Helps. Yeah.
Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm sorry if we have delayed you uh, with uh, the length of the previous panels. I do appreciate your attendance here. Uh, it is the custom of this committee to swear all witnesses who are to offer testimony, so can I please ask you all to rise and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Let the record indicate that all of the witnesses each has uh, answered in the affirmative. As with the previous panel, uh, we'll offer a, a brief uh, introduction before we uh, ask witnesses to offer testimony. Mr. Daniel Adcock is currently Legislative Director of the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association. Before going uh, to that association, Mr. Adcock worked for the House Committee on Education and Labor's Subcommittee on Employment Opportunities and his subcommittee on human resources and was an executive assistant to the assistant secretary for aging Jeanette Takamura. Dr. Jacqueline Simon is the public policy director for the American Federation of Government Employees, also known as AFGE. AFGE watches over the rights of some 600,000 federal and DC government employees. An economist by training, Ms. Simon has worked to protect the interests of federal employees at AFGE for over 20 years. Ms. Colleen Kelly is the President of the National Treasury Employees Union, the nation's largest independent federal sector union representing employees in 31 different government agencies. President Kelly, a former IRS revenue agent, was first elected to the union's top post in 1999. I, I do want to add uh, my condolences uh, and that of the committee. Uh, we understand, Ms. Kelly, uh, the uh, incident last week uh, where uh, your, your uh, colleagues' uh, offices were attacked in Austin, Texas. I am aware that, uh, that your, uh, your organization suffered a uh, loss. Uh, Vernon Hunter, uh, Social Security Administration manager, who was uh, killed in that attack uh, in Austin. So our, our prayers are with uh, your members and uh, especially uh, the Hunter family. I understand they had six kids, and uh, I know that uh, Mr. Hunter's wife also is a, an IRS employee as well, so it uh, makes it even, even more difficult, but uh, we, we do offer our condolences in that respect, and we appreciate the fact that you're da you were down there uh, helping with those employees, and I know we had quite a few injured as well. Uh, Mr. Jo John E. Calfee is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research who studies the pharmaceutical industry and the Food and Drug Administration. He previous work, pre previously worked at the Federal Trade Commission, Bureau of Economics, and has also taught marketing and consumer behavior at the business schools of the University of Maryland, at College Park, and Boston University. Mr. Larry McNeely is a U.S. Public Interest Research Group's healthcare advocate, advocating the organization's federal level advocacy, communication, and organizing on health care reform. Mr. McNeely lobbies Congress for legislation that will tame rising health care costs and offer consumers better choices in the health care marketplace. Uh, as uh, was indicated earlier, the little box there in front of you will uh, be green when uh, you should be speaking, yellow when you should think about wrapping up, and red when you should uh, stop offering testimony. Uh, Mr. Daniel Adcock, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Lynch, I appreciate the opportunity to testify. I'm Daniel Adcock, Legislative Director of the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association. Two important issues to our membership are access to the latest in pharmaceutical ecology technology and ways to manage the costs associated with life-saving and life-enhancing drugs. Under the expected technological revolution in medicines, diseases that were once fatal or debilitating will become chronic and manageable. Ailments once requiring surgeries or stays in hospitals or nursing homes will be treated by pharmacology at home. Due to advances in human genomics, our medicines will now be tailored to our own DNA. This means drugs will be more likely to treat our ailments while mitigating side effects and drug interactions. Many women suffering from breast cancer have been prescribed tamoxifen have already been the beneficiary of this new age of medicine. 
and this is only the beginning. The medicine bottle cap may be able to tell your cell phone or home computer where you mislay the bottle or alert you if a child or other unauthorized person has opened it. Your doctor's office or a family ma member may be able to know if the bottle was open and your daily dose removed. Then there's the pill itself. Embedded in the very tablet is likely to be a computer chip that reminds you or someone else that you took the medicine in the correct dosage and whether it was metabolized correctly. The role the PBM will play in this evolutionary change will only become more critical in providing access to cutting edge drugs while containing costs. Transparency and oversight will become even more important. We can accept the cost of advanced drugs as long as we can be assured that they are safe and effective and that the process of drug pricing such, uh, pricing such drugs is fair. That is why NARF is particularly interested in guaranteeing that the savings achieved by PBMs are passed on to enrollees. We are pleased that H.R. 4489 tackles this issue. We are heartened to see that the President's budget emphasizes and continues the responsibility of OPM's Inspector General in auditing prescription drug benefits and the role of PBMs. Hopefully this will improve the contract negotiation process, hold costs in check, and ensure against fraudulent claims. For the, 200, for the uh, 2010 FEHBP contract year, OPM has now requested more information from carriers as they contract with PBMs for their services. Let us hope this brings further information to OPM and the beneficiaries. Drug pri pricing is very complex. With the processes that involve the drug formulary and the choices between generics and brand names, plus the costs associated with disease management and patient information. Although drug formularies can help to contain costs, they can also prevent patients from getting the most efficacious medication. For that reason, we are glad that H.R. 4489 gives physicians the final say on which drugs should be dispensed. Still, OPM is not alone in seeking greater transparency. In fact, human resource professionals outside government are developing transparency standards to ensure the PBMs are sharing manufacturer rebates and negotiating the lowest possible cost of specific drugs. This experience could be helpful to OPM. It appears that some of what has been proposed in H.R. 4489 could be implemented under OPM's regulatory authority. For that reason, OPM could get a jump start on enhancing its oversight of PBMs before H.R. 4488 becomes law and codifies the additional authority that would, be pro that would be provided to the agency. Still, we strongly believe that nothing should be left to chance regarding OPM's ability to access PBM information. For that reason, we believe that transparency should ultimately be legislated. As we continue to work with you on this important legislation, NARF would be interested in information from OPM or the Congressional Budget Office on cost savings, formulary development, and administrative costs that might arise from such regulatory or legislative initiatives. Beyond H.R. 4489, we believe FEHPP plans should, uh, FEHPP plans should buy prescription drugs from enrollees at the discount mandated by the federal supply schedule. However, if the FSS were to be used, FEHPP plans must have the option of buying off formulary medications. NARF would also support your proposal to designate FEHPP PBMs as subcontractors under federal acquisition rules. We commend you for your interest in fair prescription drug pricing in the FEHPP, and we look forward to working with you on this issue. Your prescription for the future of our health insurance program is a welcome addition, and we thank you for your effort. Thank you, Mr. Adcock. Dr. Simon, you now recognize for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Lynch, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Focusing on the operations of pharmacy benefit managers is an excellent place to begin improving the affordability of FEHBP since the costs they impose are a big cause of the program's continuously rising prices and its lack of affordability for so many of our members. Although AFGE strongly supports H.R. 4489, I'd like to focus my statement today on one provision of the bill that, if altered slightly, could have a significant impact on the cost of FEHBP. Specifically, that provision involves limiting the prices that PBMs can charge to FEHBP carriers. The maximum price for prescription drugs in the bill, it, it says, would be an amount that's equal to the average manufacturer price for the drug, as disclosed by the manufacturer. 
However, given the size of FEHBP, AFGE believes that the government and plan participants should receive the full advantages of their purchasing power, and that means a better bargain than average prices. That PBMs may be currently charging FEHBP higher than average prices for drugs is unconscionable. AFGE supports a much stronger pricing standard than that which is set forth in the proposed legislation. We would recommend limiting these prices to the amounts provided for in the prescription drug price schedules used by the Department of Veterans Affairs, DVA. Alternatively, the legislation could limit the maximum reimbursement to a, quote, most favored customer pricing model. Technically, the General S Services Administration, GSA, delegates authority to negotiate these prices and has done so for DVA. There's no reason why the same authority could not be extended to, to OPM with regard to FEHBP, but it would be far more efficient for OPM to simply use the VA prescription drug pricing schedule. We've heard the arguments from the organized pharmaceutical industry that extending statutory pricing schedules to additional federal health care programs will result in higher prices for all government purchasers. They seem confident that no one can or will expect pharmaceutical companies to accept lower aggregate profits. AFGE believes that we should all call their bluff. Even if the co drug companies do succeed in raising prices for all federal purchasers as the price of selling to all federal programs at a uniform price, it's likely that the government will still save money. FEHBP is large enough that a substantial decrease in its drug prices could offset retaliatory price increases that the drug companies might try to impose. A final concern involves pricing transparency, which has been discussed a lot here today. AFGE believes that in order for the legislation to have meaningful price transparency, the requirements of TINA, the Truth and Negotiations Act, should be applied to the program. Both, both FEHBP carriers and PBMs utilized by the carriers should be required to make available to the government agencies all cost and pricing data related to the purchase or reimbursement of prescription drugs by these entities. They provide it to other uh, uh, federal agencies and other contracting uh, situations, and there's no reason they shouldn't be required to provide that same data in this context. In addition, AFGE believes that the application of cost accounting standards should specifically be applied to the FEHV carriers and PBMs in order to ensure that accounting for the pricing and reimbursement of prescription drug costs is performed in a uniform and consistent manner. The President's uh, fiscal year 2011 budget proposal indicates that OPM's Office of the Inspector General intends to develop its ability to audit PBMs. The budget cites OPM estimates that prescription drugs make up 26 percent of FEHBP's costs and will total $11 billion next year. The benefits of more thorough auditing should be substantial. Requiring FEHBP carriers and the PBMs to adhere to the cost accounting standards will give the OPM IG the tools it needs to carry out these audits in a way most advantageous to taxpayers and enrollees. This concludes my testimony and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Simon. President Kelly, you now recognize for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Lynch. I am here on behalf of NTEU members who participate in FEHBP and diligently pay their ever rising premiums for health insurance only to receive reduced coverage and higher co pays and co insurance costs for their prescription drugs. We were very pleased to participate in the subcommittee's drug pricing forum last September that aptly highlighted the incongruity in FEHB a program with one of the largest enrollee pools of 8 million people, as we've heard, yet one that gets the worst prescription drug prices in government. H.R. 4489 takes a giant step forward in addressing the problems of why OPM has been unable thus far to better leverage what should be a significant advantage. According to OPM's Inspector General, as we've heard, the cost structures of the pharmacy benefit managers in FEHB are utterly non-transparent. Because the contracts cannot be audited properly under the current system, OPM does not have all of the information it needs to make, a substantive, to make any substantive improvements. Common sense dictates that U.S. taxpayers, and especially FEHBP enrollees, who saw their premiums rise roughly by 9 percent this year, or 15 percent if they were a single, single enrollee in the popular Blue Cross Blue Shield standard plan, deserve better than that. 
H.R. 4489 says, if a PBM and carrier want to participate in FEHBP, certain conditions need to be met. NTEU supports this approach in the accompanying goals of transparency and accountability. A tenet of transparency and accountability is increased disclosure. Just as the administration calls for greater disclosure in government through information and data sharing by federal agencies and individuals, it is only fitting for these billion dollar private companies who make a profit from government business to become more transparent through disclosing relevant information as well. If PBMs want to participate in FEHBP, they should be held accountable as 4489 proposes to do. Therefore, NTU supports Section 2H of the bill, which would allow OPM to access information on arrangements the PBMs have with manufacturers and pharmacies. The range of information that OPM would have available through these kinds of disclosures would include corporate-wide rebate reports, rebate allocation methodology, benchmark pricing, and various fees at different stages. These will all put the agency in a position to better do its job. We are not advocating public dissemination of proprietary information but we are advocating disclosure to OPM as needed so it can monitor the federal program. We also support the bill's approach to prescription drug rebates in Section 2C and believe the language could be clarified even further to improve FEHBP. PBMs were originally intended to handle administrative functions associated with drug claims. Now PBMs negotiate for discounted drug rates and receive hidden payments and rebates from manufacturers as well as other fees and payments from carriers. Under Section 2C, with 99% of rebates and fees being returned to the insurance carriers, NTU would also recommend additional clarifying language to ensure that the funds recaptured will be dedicated to the FEHBP program and be used to keep enrollee costs down, as we understand DOD's TRICARE health plan does. Under TRICARE, rebates are put back into the insurance program and the PBM receives an administrative fee for services. NTU also believes the consumer protections in 4489 are a very positive step. The ones on drug switching and on selling claims data and on timely explanation of benefits. The PBM does not know what is best for patients, so the drug switching issue should go away and the only way that should be able to occur is with appropriate medical input. We support an end to that practice. Now, on selling claims, while we question the practice of selling FEHBP claims data at all, at a minimum, OPM's concurrence should be a part of that process. And on EOBs, FEHBP enrollees will benefit from this added disclosure of prescription drug costs, enhancing their ability to choose the best plans for their needs. Finally, NTU would support adding language to 4489 to provide a pilot test of statutory pricing. We have long believed that OPM should investigate the possibility of buying prescription drugs off of the federal supply schedule, as we've heard that the VA and Defense do. Their drug prices are substantially lower than FEHBP. Ten years ago, I testified before Congress in favor of a small pilot that OPM had approved for the SAMBA health care plan to allow access to the federal supply schedule for its mail order drug program. SAMBA argued it could save 3% annually in enrollees' premium shares by directly buying from the government. Overall savings would have been $2.4 million annually, uh, and that was back in $2,000. Despite OPM's approval, the pharmaceutical industry, whose profits 12 years ago were estimated at $26 billion, pulled out, and they refused to participate in the plan. NTU would support a demonstration project to examine hard numbers associated with the direct purchase of drugs through the FSS, and we would support adding a provision to H.R. 4489 to make that happen. I believe this approach offers a real opportunity for cost savings. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and we'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Kelfie, you now recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a privilege to, uh, to speak at these hearings. The views I, rep I present are my own, not those of any organization, including the American Enterprise Institute, which does not take institutional positions on specific le legislation, litigation, or regulatory proceedings. H.R. 4489 focuses on the role of pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs, as we have heard, in federal employees' health benef benefit plans. On the whole, the provisions of 4489 would do far more harm than good for consumers and patients and would increase health care costs. This bill is based on the assumption that competition does not work well in the PBM market. The facts belie this premise. 
Competition is vigorous and multifaceted. Standalone PBMs compete among themselves and also compete with retail pharmacies, large health insurance plans, large employers, and even pharmaceutical manufacturers themselves. In this highly competitive environment, employers and insurance plans have negotiated a rich variety of PBM contracts that reflect the specific preferences of the contracting parties. Another indicator of vigorous competition is the fact that a detailed investigation by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, found very little evidence of favoritism or self-dealing on the parts of PBMs, regardless of who owned the PBMs. 4489 would force nearly complete transparency in the financial arrangements between PBMs and their partners. This would be difficult to achieve. But if the legislation does bring this kind of transparency, it would undermine the incentives of PBMs to negotiate discounts from from pharmaceutical manufacturers. This has been recognized by the FTC staff and by other economists. 4489 would also require PBMs to pass on virtually all the savings they realize from aggressive cost cutting. This would undermine the incentives to cut costs in the first place. These, this cost cutting, cost, <coughs> excuse me, cost cutting comes primarily from uh, negotiating uh, rebates from pharmaceutical manufacturers. Uh, <clears throat> undermining these incentives would raise costs. This adverse consequence of regulation has also been recognized by FTC economists and by others. 4489 would also establish price controls, which rarely, if ever, does good in competitive markets. The prohibition on negotiating a spread between payments to manufacturers and to pharmacies would discourage PBM from seeking to reduce drug prices and costs. Giving OPM the power to set ceilings on pharmacy dispensing fees would require OPM to uncover the true costs and benefits of, of dispensing for pharmacies. This is not easily done, and it could easily disrupt access or even increase costs. 4489 would prohibit health plans from reimbursing more than what is called the average manufacturer price, or APM, and OPM would be granted new oversight powers on drug pricing. There is no reason to think this would reduce price directly, prices directly because manufacturers can adjust prices outside of the FEHB system. But this measure could easily set the stage for direct price controls over, ma over pharmaceuticals, as we have already heard. This would have extremely adverse consequences for researching and developing new drugs and new uses for approved drugs. 4489 would also impose restrictions on who can own a PBM. This would tend to reduce competition. In addition, these restrictions would deprive the marketplace of the benefits of vertical integration. For example, ownership restrictions would sometimes add extra steps in the pricing of drugs as they proceed through various channels from manufacturers to patients. 4489 would also expand regulation of drug formularies. Little, if any, evidence indicates that PBMs harm patients through the design and operation of formularies. New restrictions are more likely to raise costs than to improve health. Finally, 4489 would grant OPM the power to prevent PBMs from selling information on drug utilization and sales. This would be unfortunate. This kind of information can play an important role in the larger task of improving pharmaceutical targeting and use. And again, there is little, as any, little, there is little if any evidence of consumer harm from these practices. For all these reasons, I respectively urge this committee to reconsider 4489. There is no reason to prevent employers, health plans, and pharmacies from negotiating whatever arrangements they wish with PBMs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McNeely, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the committee, I very much appreciate the opportunity to come before you today and testify about um, this bill and its effort to control drugs and the, the cost of drugs in fe the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program. Uh, as I said, my name is Larry McNeely. I'm the healthcare advocate with the United States Public Interest Research Group. U.S. PERG, as we call it, is a national federation of uh, state-based consumer advocacy organizations. With a, we have a 35-year history of standing up for consumers and we're convinced that both strong competition and strong consumer protection are essential to the functioning of any market. Unfortunately, the pathway for pharmaceutical delivery in this country, the market for pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical benefit managers, PBMs, lacks that adequate competition and it lacks the consumer protections that are required. And that's why the reforms envisioned in H.R. 4489 are so necessary to help bring down costs. And in explaining the benefits of transparency, I think a lot has been said uh, in this panel and 
the previous panels. I just want to uh, refer to the comments of Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust, Christine Varney, who highlighted its importance when she said, I am a firm believer in what Justice Brandeis said in another context. Sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants, electric light the most efficient policeman. Markets work better and attempted harms to consumers are more likely to be thwarted when there is increased transparency to consumers and government about what's going on in an industry. Um, and you know, I could not say it better. In my written testimony, I go into more detail, but just to outline a couple of the essential points. If the three essential elements of any competitive marketplace are choice, transparency, and a lack of conflict of interest, you know, the PBM market actually lacks each one of those three. It's highly concentrated. Um, we are actually have some evidence, which I detail in here, of uh, legal action to stop deceptive and fraudulent practices. Uh, and we continue to see these practices of drug switching and self-dealing, uh, which are not only unfair to um, uh, federal employees in this particular context, but are, are spread more broadly across uh, across the healthcare market, and we really think needs addressing uh, in other legislation. Um, we believe enacting HR 4489 will lead to significant cost savings for taxpayers. The uh, proposed legislation will actually lead to a reduction in pharmaceutical costs by requiring the pass through of rebates and prohibiting the practices of drug switching and spread pricing. And it will protect employees and, and taxpayers by um, uh, preventing conflicts of interest um, that we've run into in cases like uh, CVS Caremark, where a, a PBM is owned by a retail chain. Um, this, you know, these assertions are backed up by a growing body of evidence that demonstrates that tra plan transparency does allow uh, plan sponsors to monitor and curb their prescription drug spending. I detail a number of examples, uh, but in one case in New Jersey, uh, when they switched to a pharmaceutical, uh, for a pharmaceutical benefit manager contract that was transparent uh, for 600,000 covered employees, they're now projected to find 558.9 million in savings over six years. If we're talking about 8 million federal employees, um, certainly a substantial uh, uh, amount of resources are uh, uh, available. And just to sum up, I think, our attitude and why we're, I think, so grateful to the sponsors of this legislation for moving it forward, is that without the protection afforded in HR 44, 89, it's as if the pharmaceutical benefit uh, management industry is saying to taxpayers, saying to federal employees, you know, give us $10, $10 billion of your money and trust us. Um, the PBM industry as a whole, as we demonstrate in some of the lawsuits that I detail in my testimony, has not earned that trust. Um, and uh, we should make sure, I hope this legislation gets favorable consideration by the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. I know you have myself uh, five minutes. I want to thank you all for your testimony. I really appreciate your willingness to come before the committee. Uh, Mr. Calfee, uh, I have great respect for the American Enterprise Institute. They have long been uh, advocates of good government, I, I think. And I'm a little puzzled. Uh, I know that you testified uh, uh, previously before the House Energy and Commerce Committee uh, to the effect that uh, that prescription drugs in the Medicaid program uh, should more closely reflect costs. Now, during today's hearing, you have heard uh, both Republican and Democratic members uh, express the frustration that we cannot determine what the costs are of the drugs in the FEHBP program. We have heard from the customers, uh, the users, that they cannot determine what the costs are of the drugs offered in the FEHBP program. We have heard from the Office of Personnel Management, responsible for oversight of the FEHBP program, that they indeed cannot determine what the costs are of the drugs in the FEHBP program. We've heard from the Inspector General 
uh, of, of the OPM who says, and he is principally responsible for the oversight here, that he cannot determine what the costs are in the drugs for the FEHBP program. And we even have a, an example uh, of a program where 300 drugs are offered to the general public with no insurance, with no insurance, and they are paying less money than insured individuals are paying through their pharmacy benefit managers in the FEHBP program, which is funded on an average 72% uh, by the taxpayer, roughly 28% by, by premiums paid for by the individual. Why, why would you support, you know, the principle that Medicaid drugs should be, you know, uh, as closely as possible uh, priced based on cost, and yet your testimony here today seems to, to be at, at, at uh, variance with that, if not directly opposed to it. Um, you're referring to my own testimony in, in connection with Medicaid? Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to remember what I said, but I imagine what I said was that the Medicaid should pay market prices. Um, rather than getting a, a, a special fixed discount from market market prices, but you know they should go out in the market. We would testify in 2005 before the House Energy Commerce Committee. It says closely reflect costs. By cost, I was referring to market prices. Certainly, I was not referring to the cost of manufacturing the drugs because okay. those costs are very very small compared to any 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 prices. But my understanding, especially from the testimony of Mr. O'Brien earlier today is that all of these plans are free to reach contracts with PBMs that do provide for disclosure. In fact, I believe that's what um, Argosy Systems um, specializes in. Uh, and so my understanding is that if a plan wants to have transparency, if they want to have the rebates passed through to them, they can arrange through that. They can arrange for that through contracts. And so I think the issue here is whether or not they have the freedom to either have a contract that does provide for transparency and, and pass through rebates or to have a contract that doesn't do that. And what we've heard in the, in the, in the private sector and you know, out, outside of FEHB is you get both kinds of contracts. You get contracts with transparency, ones without, et cetera, et cetera. The plans experiment with different ones. Sometimes they save money from when they switch to one approach to another, and sometimes they don't. But, sir, in this case, we are, we are the customer. I am a federal employee. I am an oversight officer on behalf of the federal employees. It's not as if we said we want a contract with no, no transparency. We're demanding transparency, and we can't get it. Nor can the, of the Office of the Inspector General. We can't get that transparency. Nor can the Office of Personnel Manager. We can't get that. Uh, you know, the, the PBMs and, and uh, uh, you know, the contracting parties here are saying that it's a matter of, uh, uh, you know, proprietary advantage and they don't want to disclose that. So uh, we have had instances where it's gone to court uh, in the state of Maine example where, uh, you know, I think the, the heat of that, that litigation, you know, broke the case open for the state of Maine and it was a great advantage. But, uh, absent that urgency and, and the consent decree that, that was rendered in that case, uh, that transparency would not be forthcoming. So it's not like, oh, we'd prefer transparency, oh, we would not prefer transparency. We're demanding it and we cannot get it. That, that's, that's the truth of the matter here on behalf of e everyone that, that I mentioned, Republican and Democrat, so far. Um. <clears throat> Again, I know in the private sector outside of FEHB, it's, it's fairly common. It's not the rule, but it's fairly common. It does happen that a, a plan will have a contract for transparency, such as with Argosy Systems that we heard about earlier. But if you think about negotiating, you know, a, a PBM negotiating with a drug manufacturer, if it wants to get a discount on a certain drug, and if that manufacturer knows that any discount he provides will instantly be communicated through the plans to other drug manufacturers, and the, and the other manufacturer will probably offer to match that price, then what the manufacturer knows during the negotiating process is there really isn't much to be gained by the manufacturer by, by providing a discount because they will end up having to give, to give that discount to everyone. So I think it's 
you know, economic reasoning does suggest that if you force transparency, you can make these negotiations more difficult, discounting more difficult to obtain. And I think that's fairly close. I wouldn't call it a consensus, but I would say the bulk of, of economists follow that line of reasoning, including specifically the Federal Trade Commission and also um, the I, CEO. I appreciate that. But I think we did hear testimony here today, and in my bill specifically, it's not, uh, it, it's not requiring uh, you know, public dissemination of uh, proprietary uh, interests here. We're talking about you need to tell the Office of the Inspector General for OPM. They already receive proprietary information. They guard that, guard that jealously. It, and in fact, if that, if that information got out, it would hurt their credibility enormously uh, and, and affect their, negatively their ability to do their job. So uh, that's why we're suggesting it just be, uh, you know, it, yeah, I wasn't limited, limited disclosure. Let me, let me go on, though. Uh, Mr. Adcock, uh, I know that you, uh, you mentioned earlier the, uh, the number of uh, NARF employees uh, that, are, that are included under the FEHBP program. Uh, let me ask you, what, what are the general, what's the general assessment uh, in terms of your own employees, uh, your own members, excuse me, uh, attitudes towards the current uh, FEHBP program, specifically towards uh, OPM's oversight of, uh, of uh, prescription drug programs within the FEHBP? Well, I, I think it's kind of a love-hate relationship. Um, on one hand, I think that they're, they're happy that they have uh, health insurance that's equivalent to what other large employers provide, but I think they hate the fact that they're paying premiums in the double digits for the last several years. Uh, with regard to, to, uh, to prescription drugs, I mean, I think they understand very clearly that that is one of the huge cost drivers in the program and responsible for huge premium increases. Now, uh, I, I think that over the years, they've, because of the fact that several years ago, uh, they were encouraged through uh, cost sharing to start using mail order uh, uh, prescription drugs and thereby farmer school benefit managers, they're now accustomed to doing that. Um, I think that where we, where, where, where there's concerns that we hear most often is, is that when we hear examples that individuals that don't have any insurance at all uh, can go into a drugstore and get a better price on, on, uh, on a spe specific type of drug than they can through the insurance, that's troublesome to them. When they hear about that state attorney generals uh, all over the country uh, are involved with legal action against farmers who benefits, that's troublesome. And so, you know, on one hand, I, I, you know, I think that w when you're talking about the customer service that they have with pharmaceutical benefit managers and arranging for their drugs uh, to be purchased, you know, I think a lot of these PBMs have very good customer service. But when they hear about these stories, they want to know what's going on behind, behind the curtain. And that's why I think for a lot of them, they're very interested in the subject matter of this legislation and transparency. Dr. Simon, can I ask you the same question with respect to, uh, I know the American Federation of Government Employees has a tremendous amount of employees affected as well. What, what are the attitudes, I don't know if you, you're uh, close to that level of uh, feedback, but. Oh, I, I am, but I just want to say, especially in light of the oath that we took at the beginning of the uh, panel here, I never finished my dissertation, so I'm not Dr. <laughs> Simon. <laughs> okay. But in any All case. Right. We won't um, hold that against you. But thank you for the, for the uh, uh, presumption. Um, in fact, we, uh, AFGE is have, holding its, its annual legislative conference this week, and um, during the issues briefing this weekend, uh, I don't think there was any subject that um, raised people's uh, hackles more than uh, what's been going on in FEHBP. Wow. Um, part of that is because of the national health care reform bills that would impose a, a so-called Cadillac tax on their, on their FEHBP plans, and I think today's hearing shows that there's nothing, um, nothing about the benefits that, that um, make it a Cadillac. It's uh, the fact that uh, we pay too much. Uh, the price is too high, but the benefits aren't necessarily luxurious or comprehensive. And, and so if that goes forward, they'd get hit again uh, for something that's completely beyond their control. Um, 
you know, we, we often, when we testify on FEHBP, uh, note the fact that there are, we, we don't know the number exactly, but there are uh, at least a couple hundred thousand, if not more, federal employees who are eligible to participate in FEHBP but don't uh, participate and don't have insurance from another source because they can't afford the premiums that are on average now 30 percent for the enrollee, and they keep going up. And um, so many of our um, members work in veterans' hospitals or in prisons and uh, in DOD medical facilities where they may be uh, providing these uh, prescription drugs to inmates or patients in the, you know, veterans or patients in the DOD hospitals, and they know that the same government that's paying for their health insurance through FEHBP is paying one price when, if they were prescribed that drug, and a completely different price when they're dispensing it in a VA hospital or a prison or through the Indian Health Service. And they're very, very aware of the fact that FEHBP has not been run in a way that would minimize the cost to taxpayers or enrollees. And, and as it gets more and more expensive and each year as a higher and higher percentage of overall premiums is shifted onto the employees, they're livid. They're livid. They're getting a small pay increase and they're FEHBP uh, premiums are going up, 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 and they're not. Ha they're, they they like this legislation. Okay, thank you, uh, President Kelly. I know you've got a you've got a pile of employees that are that are also affected all over the place, right? We do, we do, Chairman Lynch, and, but it does come down to the single issue of the cost of the plan, and because everything points to the fact that these annual increases are um, so directly tied to the cost of prescriptions. Uh, and I would also say that the, um, the forum that you held last September, um, you know, on this issue, for those who did not know about the federal supply schedule and the prices that were being, pa being paid so differently at uh, DOD and VA, they know that now. And uh, they have more questions about why that would be allowed to continue to happen and why OPM, um, the question has always been what OPM will do to better leverage uh, the 8 million enrollees. And of course, like I said, it, um, it always comes back to the prescription drugs is the one uh, element that is always pointed to when the annual prices, the annual increases are announced each year. Well, let me ask you about that then. You know, uh, we, we had this forum. Uh, I guess I had an inclination to try to do the simplest thing, which we have a government purchasing system uh, under the, uh, the FSS, that federal supply schedule. And it's fairly, well, it's well known. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's well used, it's, it's established, and uh, it's used in general government purchasing. And it's fairly transparent. You, you, you put it out there what you're going to charge the government for providing a certain material or service, and it's competitive. And my thought was rather than this very, very uh, Rube Goldberg type construction that we've got for federal employees' health benefits uh, on the pharmacy side, let's just put it out there like we would for widgets. Uh, and you offer your price to the government, and we accept it or reject it. We can consider quality and, and uh, level of service. Let's just do that. And uh, the PBMs were the loudest critics of that system because it would eliminate them from the whole process, basically. Uh, at the same time, now that's a very crude solution to our problem. It, it simplifies things, but you know, I'll, I'll take for granted that, that widgets are not the same as pharmaceuticals being recommended by a physician for the health care of, of that individual, and there's some important differences there. However, uh, when you look at the VA system uh, that's out there, that works pretty well. They have a fixed formulary, however, so there's limited. There's, there's a more limited choice, although there are there are waivers under certain circumstances. How would your members respond to that if if there was a a, a fixed formulary? Because that's going to reduce, conceivably, it's going to reduce some level of choice for some of these, you know, exotics or, or some of these less commonly used uh, pharmaceuticals. It's going to be a limitation on choice. Uh, how are they going to balance the likes and dislikes of a system that might have a fixed formulary but a much lower price across the board? 
I, I would uh, I, I don't know how they will react to uh, change in general but any kind of a positive change I think would be received but one of the things that NTU has recommended is that this be done as a pilot, that it not just be an across the board, yeah. because then all of the benefits that we already know exist, such as a transparency, right. um, you know, and for those who oppose it, it's already there. It's, uh, you know, the, the obstacles that they're raising are, have already been overcome with the use of the FSS. So yeah. let's try it in a pilot in, you know, one or two of the plans in the program and see exactly uh, you know, what kind of a, an impact it would have and if there are other issues that are created that, that haven't been thought about. Like I said, there are, there are waivers or there are ways to, you know, if something's not on the formulary, there's a, there's a, if you make a showing that this is needed, then there's a way to get around that. But uh, it does put uh, sort of a gatekeeper on, on the, the formulary. Uh, Mr. McNeely, uh, you had some great testimony uh, earlier on about, uh, you know, competitiveness and, uh, and transparency. Uh, are, there, are there items, as you look from U.S. PERG's uh, uh, standpoint, are there items that should be added to this legislation that might, that, that may, we may have forgotten or that you might think would be helpful? Yes, and we'd be happy to work with you, but uh, we generally believe that there's some steps that will be taken to strengthen the consumer protections within FEHBP um, by establishing an om ombudsman and some other measures, which I'd be happy to work with the committee in terms of uh, those suggestions. Uh huh. An ombudsman in what, what respect? Uh, with appeals to which body? The, the, the carrier, the pharmacy, the uh, PBM? Um, it's okay, you know, that, yeah. well, I'm getting a little deep in the weeds here and, and I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any other uh, matters that, that we've overlooked here in terms of trying to, uh, as I said at the outset, this legislation is not etched in stone and we've, we heard, uh, we've heard from both panels, all three panels actually, uh, I think constructive recommendations that we could improve our bill, and, and we're happy to do that. Uh, but are there are there other items that that you think? Uh, how how about the the suggestion that was made by uh, Representative Treat from Maine about uh, importing a standard of fiduciary responsibility on the part of the PBM to act as fiduciary on behalf of uh, of, of the plan, of the, the, the insured, the participants. Any thoughts on that? Uh, the uh, imposing a fiduciary duty on the insurance carrier and on the PBM. PBM. On the PBM. Uh, I, I guess I don't know enough about how, how what, what kind of responsibilities that would involve and what the, what the, what the checks would be in terms of the oversight on the employer to ensure that they were actually complying <laughs> with those fiduciary duties. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, you know, as an employer, you're a fiduciary of, of or should be at least a fiduciary of your health plan on behalf of your, of your employees and retirees, but I'm not sure exactly how that would work with a PBM. Well, I, I think what they're trying to get at is this. You're hiring a pharmacy benefit manager to get you the best deal. That, that PBM goes out there, negotiates a deal for you as your agent but unbeknownst to you because of the way the system works right now they they pocket uh, part of the advantage that you paid them you, you've already paid them as your agent to go out there and and get a good deal then they get you a good deal a great deal maybe and but then they pocket part of the advantage and come back to you and give you some le measure less than what you paid them to get you. And so, you know, that sort of gives a little bit of a snapshot on the problem here, right. that these deals are all going on and you never know what the real cost, as Mr. Weiner started, uh, testified, you never know what that, that bottom line cost was. Uh, but with a fiduciary responsibility, it would make it clearer that the benefits flow to you, that that person, that, that PBM is out there negotiating for your benefit as your agent and, and 
it would require full disclosure of any advantageous relationship that they that they uh, uh, engaged in that may be in contravention of, of your own interest. I guess my question would be is, is, is that if there is such a fiduciary duty, what sanctions are against, would be made against the PBM if they, if they breach that well, duty? There's a great deal of case law uh, that's been developed around the responsibility of uh, fiduciary responsibility, and I think that would all be imported. Uh, those standards would be implied, or not implied, they would be, uh, they would be applied uh, if we, we import the, response, the, the fiduciary relationship uh, you know, with respect to a PBM and the people that you represent. Uh, I think. Okay. Uh, you know what? I, I, I just want to ask you each if you have, a, you know, anything that you'd, you'd like to add. We have about, this is a series of roll calls, so I, I don't want to, I, I would rather be able to dismiss the panel and, and adjourn the hearing. Uh, then, then come back. So I think we're probably at that uh, that point anyway. You've suffered enough. <laughs> Ms. Simon. Oh well, I just would say very quickly. Um, I think that this idea of of imposing fiduciary responsibility on the PBM uh, e makes it m makes it even more important that um, we would have uh, the cost and pricing data that that um, would be triggered by application of TINA, the Truth and Negotiations Act. Um, we would find out what prices they were charging to all their customers and what the actual cost of production of these of these drugs. Um, is and that uh, you know when, in many cases when you're you're buying drugs you're you're um, uh, it's a sole source contract it's a, uh, and and that's what triggers the uh, applicability of TINA where you find out this data again a proprietary da proprietary data that would be held by the agency so it wouldn't be made public but it would allow us um, it would allow the government to enforce this fiduciary standard on the PBM. So either way, we need this data. We need this information. Okay, great. President yeah. Kelly? Uh, I, I will be looking more at the main um, experience and at that language, but it just seems to me that that language on fiduciary responsibility would add to the transparency, which is the goal of, you know, of the legislation, and that that would be an enhancement to it. Yeah, that's my reading as well. Mr. Calfee, please. Yeah, I would suggest that the, uh, the most dangerous and counterproductive part of this legislation um, is, is the pass-through. Um, if, uh, if you say to a PBM, we want you to go out and negotiate on a really good discount, you know, negotiating discounts is not a straightforward thing. I mean, if anyone can walk into a pharma firm and said, give me a 20% discount and they would give it to them, and, you know, everyone would get the discount. It's a, tri it's a tricky business. And if you say to the PBM, we want you to go out there and do all this work in negotiating and discounting and figure out these clever things, you know, with, you know, working with formularies and so on, and then give all the returns to us, you're not going to get any discounts. What it really does is it puts the onus on the plan to negotiate the discount. If they can do that, fine. Sometimes they can, but sometimes they can't. Okay. Mr. McNeely. Yes, I just wanted to weigh in on the fiduciary responsibility piece. Uh, we'd have to take another look at the main legislation, but I, I think we're generally inclined to uh, support that, that direction if that's the uh, direction the committee moves with. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, as you notice, we've got several hearings going on at one time, and I'm going to leave the record open in case any of the members uh, uh, have any questions for the members of the panel. I do want to thank you very, very much for your willingness to come before the committee and help us with our work. This is, uh, this is tough stuff. It's very complicated. But I think you're each in a position that's very, uh, it has a unique perspective and it's very helpful to us in, in trying to figure out how the, what, what the intended and unintended consequences uh, might be. So I want to thank you for your testimony here and uh, you're free to go. This hearing is now adjourned.
Mr. Lynch, very, very quickly, I could ask you a couple of yes-no questions like, uh, have you enjoyed being here today? Uh, and do you want to take any more questions? I guess the answer would be yes or no. But I, <coughs> seriously, I do want to ask you. Uh, do you think that this is a, is a software or hardware problem? In, in the case of the ECC? Yeah. Um, and again, based on our analysis of what we've seen, based on going to accident sites and checking these cars out, I, I, I don't think it's either right now. But XCarrent has not tested the software yet. So that's, that's yet to come. So if there is a software issue, there's an issue about how independently these two processors are working. So that's the key to make sure that this thing works. We'll know that. But it could be either, and you're going to get to the bottom. We, we have to get to the bottom. But they, 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 it, and, it, and it may be that the bottom of it is they find nothing. And we have another independent group that goes in and researches again. And it just Mr. Lynch, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I've got. You'll back. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. That concludes our questions. This panel, Mr. Lynch, thank you. We'll thank invite you. you to stay.